Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first program director pitch session of this year's RPA Summit. And my name is Sonia Glavaška, I'm one of the program directors. I will be starting this session today, but before we start with the pitches, I wanted to tell you that more or less this session is about electrification of transportation. And first four talks are focused on aviation. And the very last talk in the session will be looking into electric ground vehicles. Uh, we will go through very fast pitches, that are, each one of them is eight minutes long, and we are saving the last portion of the session for questions and answers. So if you have some questions, please save them for the end of the, end of the session, and we will be answering them only through your submission of questions through an app. You cannot ask questions from the, from the audience. So that all being said, uh, I will start with my own fast pitch. And I need my slides. Okay. So as I said, my name is Sonia Glavaški, Program Director, and today I will talk to you about technical challenges and technology that we are facing and technologies that we need to develop to actually get aviation up in the sky. When you think about all electric aircraft, we expect them to be clean, quiet, and affordable, and they will provide essential service when it comes to transportation. So there is lots going on in this space, and you may be wondering why am I talking about it today. So there are some small aircraft that are either being used or being developed, and I picked just two. Sunflyer, which is a two-seater used for general aviation pilot training. It has three-hour flight endurance. It can carry two passengers. It uses state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries, 260 watt-hours per kilogram, and it costs 10 times less to fly it for an hour than a traditionally used general aviation two-seater that is used for pilot training. Another big driver in market is on-demand travel. And this is another aircraft that people are developing right now in Silicon Valley, it's Joby S2. If you can see, it has very different shape. It is sort of fixed-wing aircraft with 12 electric motors that provide veto, and it has a stowaway propeller for takeoff phase of the flight. It's running on lithium-ion batteries again, and again, it can carry only two people. So what is the common denominator here? These are small aircraft, small, uh, very relatively short uh, flight duration, and only a couple passengers. So I want today to visit with all of you in the audience what are the technologies we can look into to actually get this to a larger size aircraft. And if you talk to any people who are working on electric aircraft, they will tell you there are three technical challenges. Size, weight, and heat. And technologies that we have to improve are energy storage. We have to get energy storage with much better specific energy. In this particular talk, I will not go into details if this will be batteries, if this will be a fuel cell. My colleague Grigori Slovechnik will look into that. Uh, another, another technology that we we'll want to look into is more efficient propulsion. Very light, energy efficient electric motors. Right now, everybody is using Siemens motor, and we have to go just beyond that one particular motor that is available. And my colleague Michael Hadi will be actually talking about some aspects that we have to address when we develop. Uh, more efficient propulsion. I, as a systems person, want to tell you that this is all fine and better components are necessary, but not sufficient. So we have to redesign the whole system. You may say that I'm crazy, that this is not going to happen, but I want to remind you we've been there. Uh, we have to revisit what is generally believed to be truth. And fathers of aviation US have been in our shoes, and they said what is, we believe is truth. If it were truth, we could not make any progress. So let's see which truths have to be revisited. And we did some extensive back-of-the-envelope calculations. 
We are pushing the envelope, we are looking into MRJ70 that can carry 76 passengers, and we just did a calculation where we took out jet engine, took out the fuel, replaced it with electric motor, and current state-of-the-art batteries. We wanted to keep weight of the aircraft the same. We can fly this aircraft, but instead of 500 mile range that we see with MR, what we can accomplish with MRJ70, we can only go up to 70 miles. And our calculations included all phases of flight and inclu included FAA required fuel reserves. So then we asked the question, okay, how much of a battery do I need to carry to actually go to 500 miles? With the current state of the energy in the battery, we cannot do it. Weight is excessive and we cannot take off. So then I want us to step back, go back to drawing board and think, what else can we change? What else can we look into? So we've been toying with different body shapes. So we don't necessarily have to do drone or to do a fixed wing. Imagine this blended wing body aircraft that has extended wing to body ratio, that has integrated design of body and propulsion, that is made of very light materials that also have properties that uh, improve the drag, all this in package will increase lift to drag ratio, which is critical for aircraft to take off. In addition to that, depending on what is the energy storage we're using, it may have a distributed architecture, it may be located only a few places in the aircraft, and that will directly influence where we put actuation, where we put propulsion. And there are different types of actuation that we can develop, more efficient light, maybe without moving parts. And then when it comes to propulsion, we also will look into more details of how actually we can perhaps package a lot smaller, more efficient engines and deal with some issues, for example, thermal. So all this being said, let's go back to calculation and revisit what can be done if we do this jointly. So start with MRJ70 again. Now we have requirement that we want to fly 500 miles we want to carry the same passenger load, same cargo load. If we are able to improve lift to drag ratio 25% and decrease overall body weight 10%, we can actually do this assuming we have energy storage that has specific energy of 1,550 watt hours per kilogram. And this is excessive. The best projections for battery technology right now is around 500 watt hours per kilogram. So it may be a fuel cell, but you may surprise me and come up with a brand new battery that will actually do this. This, is, this number is very consistent with the projections that NASA and National Academy of Sciences have made in their studies. And then if we go even further, and we actually improve lift and drag for 20% uh, more, we decrease uh, structural weight, 45%, then we can fly 500 miles, we can carry the same load, and we can be 35% more efficient. So I would like you to walk out of this room with this idea that we cannot focus only on batteries, only on fuel cells, only on the body shape. These are all very interconnected, and we have to design system as a whole, and we have to be very smart how we integrate it and have a mission in mind and then control the whole system, manage the whole system accordingly. So all this being said, I truly believe with the brain power in this room and in the broader technical uh, community, we can get there and system approach will get us there. I hope to see some of you in all electric aircraft in the near future, and if you have any questions, please save them to the, for the end of this session. Thank you for listening. <laughs> now I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Grigory Solovechnik, who will talk more about aspects of challenges that we are facing with energy storage. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, my name is Grigory Solovichik, and I will continue a discussion on a very exciting topic of electrified future of aviation. It sort of showed that energy storage is probably the most important <coughs> stumbling block on the way to develop electrified transportation. 
So batteries or fuel cells should be used uh, in, uh, in the seven minutes. I probably will give you some answer. So uh, everybody knows this picture of taking off uh, regional aircraft with a huge smoke of uh, huge cloud of smoke, very noisy. So if we replace this uh, aircraft with electric one, we have no more pollution, no more noise, or in anybody was diverted from a small or uh, city airport just because uh, they missed the landing time. I was, it was not pleasant experience. Less emissions, uh, more efficient use of fuel, and uh, of course, low cost of transportation, more power. Uh, and we think that our electric aircraft market will be huge even in the recent 2040 year. And talking about numbers, in, from NASA report, uh, I picked these numbers which say that benefits can be expressed in energy use reduction, like 40, 60% in emission reduction, noise reduction, but with these benefits come requirements. For example, for 50 passenger aircraft, we need to have energy density more than one kilowatt per kilogram. And uh, such aircraft will consume from 4,000 to 8,000 kilowatt hour per hour. To give you an impression of what is the size of one megawatt battery, currently it's a 20 feet shipping container. Are if we'll increase uh, energy density to 500 kilowatt hour per, uh, per watt hour per kilogram, then we will have just two or three such containers in this plan. Definitely, it's not possible. Battery alone could support two to four seat short range uh, airplane, but they don't have enough energy density for regional aircrafts. Okay, and uh, many companies uh, actually diverted the efforts from pure electric battery aircraft to hybrids, which use both batteries and turbines uh, using jet fuel. And there's some examples, Zunum, Airbus, Boeing, they're all working on the hybrids. And hybrids do have high efficiency, uh, and of course it can offset higher cost of uh, such aircraft compared to traditional scheme. If you look at just the configuration of such aircrafts, battery aircraft is probably the simplest. It has high efficiency, but uh, as I said, energy density above 500 watt hour per kilogram is very unlikely. The turbines using fossil fuels and battery, it's much more complex. It requires generator, inverter, and associated losses. Uh, if we can use fuel cell and battery combination, then uh, we can use our fuels with satisfactory energy density, uh, good efficiency, and uh, it can be suitable for uh, small to medium range aircrafts. If you look at the fuels we can use, uh, for example, for compressed hydrogen, it's 1.5 kilowatt hour per liter, which is exactly the same number Sonia used for her calculation. Uh, but any liquid fuel would have much higher energy density. If you look at the uh, modeling, uh, which I did using ATR-72 body, a uh, 70 passenger aircraft, you can see that uh, the flying range for different uh, fuels would be pretty comparable with biodiesel or jet fuel, if we can make it right, okay? Uh, let's see uh, how the payload, which is the most important characteristic of air, uh, aircraft, will be changed with, from different configuration. Of course, uh, for turbine, which is efficient, it uh, uses the highest energy density fuel, the uh, payload is the highest, like uh, 5,500 <coughs> kilograms. And battery would be much less. Uh, and remember that the battery flying range is not more than probably five to 700 miles. The fuel cell, pure fuel cell uh, aircraft are turbine battery combination or fuel cell battery combination will give a bit smaller but quite decent payload, more than 4,000 uh, kilograms. If we'll do some modeling on cost, this difference would be much, much more interesting. So say for battery, again, remember that the range is small, payload is small, 
the cost, are, if we'll consider 150 kilogram dollars per kilowatt hour, which is probably within a reach in next few years, we can get a cost about of this uh, power train like 500,000. The fuel cell with very conservative uh, estimation of 400 dollars per kilowatt will give us 7 hundred uh, dollars, but the range would be much higher. Uh, is on the right side, you can see it's about 2,500 miles. Great. But uh, let's assume that we have a combination of battery and fuel cell. Because battery and fuel cell both can be scaled uh, proportionally, and we need battery just for power, and we will use uh, fuel cell for energy just to recharge better using as a range extender, for example, then we can, uh, based on our requirements for the range, for the power, we can optimize the size of fuel cell and a battery independently. And in this case, uh, having the still decent flying range, like 2,000 miles, the cost would be more than two times less than the cost of fuel cell alone and 50% are less than cost of uh, the battery alone plan. Uh, but uh, in this case, we will have all advantages flying to long range and using the pure electric aircraft. So if we talk about is it available right now, we can say yes and no. So batteries are on the track to meet this target on power, energy density, and the cost, and with the help of DOE and RPA as well. So, but the fuel cells currently are developed only for hydrogen, which is not a good fuel, as I showed you. So to make uh, fuel cells, uh, we need to uh, develop a high power, we have to develop new electric catalyst. We have to work on the system requirements to make high power density, which is the requirement, and less uh, startup time. Or, and of course, we need to cycle it many times. So answering on the question, what is electrified future of aviation, batteries of fuel cell, I can answer it should be just hybrids. You could have in batteries for power and fuel cell and liquid fuels for energy. And thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Hardy, who is our newest <laughs> addition to PD. Remind audience to please text in your questions, because if you all tr try to text questions at the very end, you know then that's really hard to actually answer them. So please, as you have questions, tag them. You don't have to wait for the end of the session. Thank you. Okay. A uh, relevant topic with more automation and electrification, we need smarter motors. So what I'm proposing to the audience today is we will make the next generation of electric motors that are substantially smaller, substantially lighter, substantially more energy efficient, and because they are incredibly more energy efficient, they give you a favorable feedback, and they even look cuter and nicer. Any problem with that? So, um, the good thing about electric motors is they're everywhere. Some 50, 51% of electricity in the US flows through electric motors. Globally, that's 47%. And if you look at total energy consumption of motors, more than 24 quads, and in case you were not sure what quad meant, uh, put in there 10 to the power 18 joules, so there's a lot of joules that you can save even with 5% efficiency improvement of electric motors. Uh, but more importantly, they are in all four major sectors of energy consumption. Residential, of course, garage door opener, bathroom fans, um, central fan, uh, pumps for water and so forth, industrial or solar applications, and as Sonia mentioned, of course, in transportation, big time. Oops, one too many. Um, so what is the um, challenge with electric motors? Anytime you have a cooler motor, 
you have better iron mobility, you have exponentially better iron mobility, you have exponentially less current leakage, therefore you have better electronics. Human brain, inside of a pool of water, thermal management, pretty sensitive, and nobody likes fevers. If you get a degree or two fever, you rush to solve it because running hot is no good. So we have had several studies in electronics that for every 10 degrees that you increase the operating temperature of a motor, you could substantially reduce the reliability, the life of the electric motor. Um, therefore, it's important that we go where the heat source is and the so-called embedded cooling to keep the motor cool at all times. More importantly, these days with variable frequency drives, you need a situation where as you're changing the RPM, um, you could also adjust your cooling so you need a more smart uh, cooling technique. I'm sure many of you have seen this type of motors. You walk by them, they are warm air coming out. It's basically the windings getting hot and then the natural convection rising the heat and then a fan is blowing through the skin of the motor to take the heat away. Not efficient, uh, not compact enough, and of course, as I mentioned before, for variable frequency drive, not an ideal situation at all either. More recently, uh, we have had some smaller solutions for thermal management of uh, the electric motor. So what I said at the beginning, um, to achieve the motor that looks nicer, that is highly more energy efficient, that is more compact and lighter, you cannot just do it by thermal management. It has to be a co-design problem. What do we mean by co-design? Material scientists, reliability engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer come together to achieve better thermal management, better packaging, better reliability, better materials. So this is, this morning we talked about innovation of the students and so forth, and I will grab one case today uh, from um, Andrew Semedi from Georgia Tech, who did his PhD, and we like more of these PhDs, and then his PhD was transformed into a company with his advisor, um, who is on leave from Georgia Tech, and so we got some data and we compared the role of thermal management and electric motors that I've mentioned. You also see to the right a jet impingement cooling solution, and then on the lower left corner, you would see another um, liquid cooling solution. But just on the role of thermal management, so I selected the best in class um, Jin Jin's uh, motor, um, which is for um, electric motors, 120 kilowatts, 96% energy efficient, 330 volts. Both um, Andrew Samedi um, or DHX company now, and Jin Jin's motor use liquid cooling. Both of them use water glycol as coolant. Yet one has better thermal management solutions. The first one on the top uh, cools the skin, whereas Andrew cools it more locally, and you can see the difference. 70% improvement in power density, more than three times improvement in um, volume, meaning more than three times uh, smaller system, twice the torque density, and 40% lighter. So this is pointing out how important thermal management is. But this is the end of the story. No, as I mentioned before, um, this is another RPOA project that actually is bringing the drive and the motor and the power electronics into one single package, courtesy of University of Wisconsin, and the program manager for this is Ashtis Kazioli from RPOA in 2017 research. But this um, project did not have thermal management as a focus, so plenty of opportunity to introduce thermal management, and when we speak of thermal management, is a sort that you go close to the heat source to make the cooling happen, um, and we call that embedded cooling. So with embedded cooling, some of the work that DARPA has done for cheap cooling, we can leverage on that. The distance between the coolant and the heat source is a hair thickness. In fact, DARPA's requirement was 100, 100 micron. Unlike the motor that I showed you earlier, where you were bringing the heat up through the skin of the motor, or Jing Jing's solution, you're cooling the skin of the motor and not going in between the windings and very close to the heat source. Also, tremendous opportunities for introducing advancement in power electronics for this next generation of motors. So all in all, what is it that we are envisioning? We are envisioning a much nicer looking motor, but at the same time, a lot more compact, a lot lighter, and a lot more energy efficient. But at RPOE, we are quantitative. 
meaning that if you give us a proposal that you're bragging about the concept, but you don't show a roadmap and you don't show quantitative goals, we don't get excited. So what are some of the proposed goals that we will have for something like this? Well, so look, um, what you see in there is DOE, VTO, Vehicle Technologies Office, um, milestones for 2022. And what we are proposing here basically puts that thing in the dust in terms of the goals that we have. But from what I showed you earlier um, from Andrew Semade or Georgia Textwork and others on thermal management, these goals are actually achievable. They are highly ambitious goals, but they are achievable. So what we are proposing is three times the power density, more than four times smaller or a better swap, size, weight, and power consumption for the whole system, incredibly more efficient, that is 98% instead of current um, lower 90s, and at the same time, because efficiency is incredibly good, we hope that the payback value between, between five years, if that happens, many industries will be able to use these motors, and in many sectors we could see them appear, making you, a lot of you rich if you approach it correctly. Thank you very much. With that, I'll, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Tu, my colleague, with a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, just to give you a fair warning, I am really going to stretch the definition of aviation focus. Really, it become down, become twofold. One, I borrowed an aviation picture from my uh, colleague's presentation. And secondly, I hope to make their jobs easier. Um, so uh, what am I trying to do? What I hope to, hope to do is really basically lower the cost of energy products and services by reducing the, essentially the cost and risk of the development process. Why? The problems that we're trying to solve continually get harder and harder as we make progress. At the same time, the problems that we're trying to solve are no less important than they were before. How? What I want to do is develop and employ machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, call it what you want, enhanced product development tools. Um, the chart on the upper right-hand side of the slide is intended to delicate, indicate the productivity challenge that we have. Um, there, there are two lines on the chart. The first line is a blue line, which is basically the U.S. the total factor of productivity growth of the U.S. economy as a function of time from the 1930s through the year 2000. And as you can see, that line is trending down, suggesting our productivity is diminishing on the whole. At the same time, the green line is the effective number of researchers that we're employing to enhance our productivity. And you can see that's basically increased 23 times um, since the year 1930, per the metric that was used in the NBR working paper that's referenced on the bottom. So, so in essence, our idea total factor productivity, which is the ratio of the blue line to the green line, has um, decreased by 41 times uh, since the year 1930, which is a rate of decrease of, of 5%. So clearly we have a challenge in the fact that our problems are getting more and more difficult to solve. Question is, what can we do to increase our productivity to hopefully address these, solve these problems uh, faster and more efficiently? So what I'm proposing to do is try and employ machine learning technologies to do so. And you might ask, well, what actually is machine learning? We hear a tremendous amount of uh, information about it in the press, a tremendous amount of hype. And so what I want to like to do is talk about at least what machine learning means to me, this 50-year-old aerospace engineer without a computer science background. Um, to me, it's certainly better search. Um, I, I'm aware of that. It's my Amazon Echo device that sits in my kitchen and tells me when to take my brownies out of the oven. And it's also image recognition technology that is capable of telling me, or searching through my pictures to tell me that not only is that a picture of a dog, it happens to be a picture of my dog. So I, I'm sure that while you can probably relate to these examples I provided, you really don't have a gist of, in some sense, I haven't really boiled down machine learning to its essence, which is kind of coincidentally what I hope what I'm going to propose is an example for the use of machine learning technology in the energy applications. We can boil complicated, high-dimensional systems down to a lower-dimensional representation that we can then optimize. So what is the magic? Well, what I want to do to illustrate that, at least in my context, I want to start at the beginning. And the beginning, the beginning is really the, beginning, the definition of the beginning that's convenient for my presentation. If we go back to 1795, Carl Gauss proposed the method of least squares where essentially you can fit a, uh, a, a line through a series of uh, complicated data points. In essence, you're boiling a complicated uh, problem down to a relatively simple one that you, then you can use for prediction, which is actually a very useful thing. Certainly, we've developed uh, since that time more advanced fitting techniques to fit more complicated curves between points. Uh, but in general, that uh, technique is called regression, 
which is really what machine learning comes down to and how it's useful for us. Certainly, the neural networks are much more complicated than the, than the straight line drawn through those points. But in essence, machine learning, for our purposes, it comes down to regression. Now, the challenge really becomes two points do indeed make a straight line, but many, many, many more points are required to develop a, a useful neural network for our purposes. So how is this relevant? Well, in the context of the design of energy products, what I'm hopeful that we can do is actually take complex representations, feed them through something I'll call an encoder, down to a much simpler representation. So in essence, what I've taken is a 162 kilobit picture, uh, picture uh, you know, three red, green, blue intensity values for each pixel, and encoded it down to a 32-bit representation, the word Emma. Now, that is certainly much simpler, and I've certainly lost a tremendous amount of information in the process, but if all I need to know is Emma, I've succeeded. Now, in the context of uh, complex product development processes, you might imagine some complex system such as an aircraft, and this is the tie to aviation. Well, what I might want to do is actually feed that, develop a simpler representation of that aircraft that I can use for um, uh, optimization, for example. So I go from a very complex system down to a, a much lower dimensional system. And so I have a series of, of numbers, essentially, that might represent the lift-to-drag ratio, the thrust-specific fuel consumption, the cost per passenger mile, or some other physical quantity that isn't really meaningful to me, but is meaningful to actually the machine learning code. So, well, how is this useful? Well, what we can actually do is then take this much simpler representation of a very complex system, feed it into what's called a decoder, which is the opposite of an encoder. So an encoder goes from complex to simple. A decoder goes from simple to complex. Now I have my complex representation of my aircraft, and I'm trying to solve some sort of optimization problem. I'm trying to maximize some performance metric relative to some constraints. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the range, maybe it's the visibility, visibility of the aircraft from above to be consistent with the red dot on my plane. Now I have my complex representation. I, I have the aircraft shape, and I feed that into some evaluation tool. Maybe it's a CFD tool, maybe it's a finite element tool that spits out some sort of performance metric. Given that performance metric, I can then take that information and feed it back in, and feed, basically feed it back into my loop and generate some modified lower dimensional representation that I can then take through the process again. So the, the gist of doing this is that hopefully what I've done is I've taken a very complex problem and hopefully made it a simpler problem that I can solve more efficiently in an optimization problem. You might ask, well, I've got these black boxes I've on the slides that I've called an encoder and decoder. Well, what on earth are those things? Um, and so an encoder is, could be some sort of a neural network. It could be what's called a convolutional neural network, which consists of a series of different layers that are essentially uh, regressions, effectively, which have weights, they have biases, they have hyperparameters, uh, that basically take a complex representation down to a much simpler one. And the lower left-hand corner is an image I borrowed from the paper that's referenced on the bottom. Well, they essentially have a, a trust structure that they encode down to a simpler representation. Um, now, what's, I, it's also, I also need to be able to go from the simple representation to the more complex one once I'm done with the problem, essentially. And that is essentially a decoder, which is a different neural network, which goes from a simple representation up to a more complex one. And to train both of these, I can essentially combine both the encoder and decoder into what's called an autoencoder, where I, f I feed into the input, I develop a, a network in between, I calculate the output, I compare the output to the input, and I keep iterating until I have the output looking like the input. So you, that sounds like a very complex process, and indeed it is. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of data and computational time required to develop these networks. And in fact, for the truss example I have there on the slide, I think there were 9,000 different trusses that were required to get to the point. So what's in the black boxes? So the, the evaluator may be a uh, traditional CFD model, finite element model, or what you could actually envision is combining the evaluator, the traditional CFD model, and the decoder to go directly from your simple representation to the uh, actual performance metric of interest. So the design trade that we have, essentially, is that we have, we're going from very complex to very simple, but of course there's a catch. You now have a very complex regression, effectively, in the middle of your complex and simple. And you have to weigh the cost of developing that complex regression process versus the cost of actually doing things the old-fashioned way. Next steps, if you're interested in this topic, there's actually an afternoon panel discussion at 345 in National Harbor 10. I'm happy to talk to you about the merits of this idea, or the lack thereof, or any other ideas you may have on this topic. Um, with luck, there'll be, if, if there's enough interest in this topic, a workshop later this year, 
And unfortunately, to answer my question up front, we're a long way from men automatically preparing presentations, so it's time to get started in next year's. Thank you very much. Actually, and I'd like to um, introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Atkinson, who's going to bring us back down to the ground. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. And as David suggests, we literally are going to go back to ground level. But before then, I'll... Uh oh. It's disappeared. So it was. Oh. Uh, I guess that slide was to remind you to, to email your questions. Is that correct? Text questions, but they have to use code. To text the questions using the code that has now disappeared. <laughs> so. <laughs> Use your very best deconvolutional de neural network to attempt to <laughs> reconstruct what the number was. But we, uh, we hope to have it in a short while. Uh, my name is Chris Atkinson, and I'm going to talk to you about how to avoid a future automotive energy dystopia. No brakes or steering wheel. The future of energy, automotive energy use, uh, we know that future cars and light trucks will be significantly more efficient than they are today. Today we have about 95% internal combustion engine vehicles, a smattering of hybrids and plug-in hybrids, and ultimately this fleet will transition over to predominantly battery electric vehicles at some point in the future. Total vehicle miles traveled, VMT as we call it, in the United States is very closely tied to economic activity and is even now increasing very rapidly. Full driverless vehicle automation, which is termed L5 automation, in other words, vehicles not requiring brakes or steering wheel, or indeed a driver, could unfortunately lead to a future energy dystopia, even if they are all XEVs, meaning BEVs, PHEVs, or fuel cell electric vehicles, due to potential unbridled increases in VMT. In other words, if we place no limits on the potential future VMT, we could be facing a future energy dystopia. And it's my supposition that a transformation to ultra-safe L3 and L4 vehicles, which do require a driver, with significant weight reduction and improved powertrain efficiency, is the very best interim energy efficiency option. The future of the automotive industry, we know that some decades hence, Vehicles will be efficient, they'll be EVs, fully automated, and quite possibly shared and not purchased. But the question remains, how do we get there? And in order to undertake that energy efficiency improvement in the future, we need several transformations, including an energy revolution, an automation revolution, and a complete transformation in the way in which cars are purchased, owned, and operated. And we are very concerned about the energy inefficient interim, as we call it. That time between now and the future decades are hence, where all vehicles will be small, lightweight, fully automated, no brakes or steering wheel. The automotive industry today, light duty vehicle fuel consumption has stagnated since 2014. We sell about 17 million vehicles a year, light duty vehicles. The total vehicle fleet is about 190 million cars. And as you know, the light duty vehicle fleet takes 10 or 15 years to turn over fully. XEV sales in 2017, we sold 1.2% BEVs, battery electric vehicles, and 2.7% hybrids. So we have a very long way to go towards a full transition of the vehicle fleet. Average personal vehicle cost is about 60 cents a mile. Unfortunately, VMT has soared. Vehicle miles traveled has soared in recent years. 3.2 trillion miles. That's 3.2 million billion miles per year in the United States alone. And it's increasing at a rapid rate, as you can see. The future of powertrains, we know at some point in the future, all vehicles will be battery powered. That's our supposition. Uh, but it's really a factor of cost, convenience, range, energy density, all the things we normally uh, know and discuss and typically have as metrics in RPE programs. The notion, however, of an EV tipping point, a single point, is overblown. Just as today we have $15,000 vehicles sold alongside $100,000 vehicles, 
So in the future, we'll have a range of potential powertrains and a range of potential options that people will use according to their cost and economic incentives, as well as the, the utility that they require from a specific vehicle and their practical needs. So the future of vehicle automation, at some point in the future, and we could argue about what time that occurs, 2040 or beyond is our supposition, we'll have full L5 automation. We currently have L0 to L3 automation available, and in the near future, L3 and L4. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested in high efficiency automated vehicles, L5 automation, and here is just a smattering of those corporations and companies that have invested in recent years. So the problem is that we face a potential future energy dystopia. This is work from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory under US Department of Energy funding. They show that due to uh, increases in VMT by uh, vehicles that are not occupied, faster travel, easier travel, empty VMT, Future energy use could be an increase of 200% over today, 200%, or a decrease of 60% over today. And the truth is, nobody knows. We have no idea of whether it'll be plus 200% or minus 60. So clearly, we wish as RPE and energy agency to avoid that plus 200 number. And if that number occurred with petroleum consumption, three times VMT today and three times petroleum consumption would be catastrophic, that's clear. On the other hand, if the future vehicle fleet uh, starting today, let's say, was fully electric, we would require about a 50%, a 5-0% increase in energy generation capacity in the United States for all vehicle miles traveled, all VMT to be conducted using electric power. That would be a 50% increase over today but three times VMT would require 150% over today, which again clearly is an energy dystopia that we would seek to avoid. Then the answer is new para transportation paradigms will save us, right? But no, unfortunately ride hailing and car sharing do not reduce VMT. Only ride sharing by two or more passengers does. And we show little inclination today, even with your Uber or Lyft costing $2 a mile, we show little or no inclination to share a ride with people. If that number was halved, if the cost of that transportation was halved, we would show even less inclination than today to share rides. And so the propensity for VMT to increase enormously is very, very real. In other words, if we don't share vehicles today, we are very much less likely to share them in the future as their cost comes down and as the convenience of using them increases. And we know about that, that's Jevons' paradox. If you make something easier and cheaper for people to use, they simply use more of it, not less. People who have low VMT requirements can typically share vehicles. People with average or high VMT will purchase them. But again, that doesn't necessarily decrease VMT overall. So we need to avert this near-term potential energy dystopia. And we can do that in two ways, reducing VMT, for example, through ride sharing, which is very tough to do, or reducing vehicle specific energy consumption, which is easier to do. And that is to make much more efficient vehicle powertrains than we have today. We can, of course, also reduce weight. And that would be a very, very good procedure to undertake. How can we reduce weight significantly? Through improving passive safety, optimize mechanical design of structures, material substitution, lightweight materials, and then in increasing intrinsic active vehicle safety, sufficient to allow L3 or L4 automation while still requiring a driver. And that's the key. Future vehicles will be efficient, L5 and perhaps shared and EVs, but this reality is many decades off. We're worried about this inefficient interim by focusing on the safe implementation of L3 and L4 automation, vehicles will be able to be lightweight and much more efficient. Still requiring a driver, which will keep an upper bound on VMT. And this will lead to the improved energy efficiency of our future vehicle fleet, preventing a potential future energy dystopia. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So now we'll go in a section where we are actually going to answer some of the questions that have been asked. So first question is uh, for myself. And the question is, uh, commercial aviation has trended toward larger aircraft. Is there sufficient demand for development of 76 passenger planes? So for mainly economic reasons, uh, commercial aircraft have been trending towards a larger aircraft. Uh, and I just want to point out that by no means I'm advocating that we need to develop exact same replica of MRJ-70. We use this for illustrative purposes and how far we have to push the technology. There are ongoing efforts to develop 10 to 15 passenger aircraft. Zunum is one of the companies that is working on that. Uh, but we have actually looked into available and underutilized infrastructure when it comes to small and regional air, uh, airports in US. So that we see as an opportunity to perhaps use in relieving some of the congestion when it comes to travel in the short distances that are up to 500 miles. And computation is very complex. Uh, you have to do some predictions how much of that traffic will actually go from ground to air, and you have to make it economically attractive to people, but there will be need for mid-range air travel. Is it going to be 76 passengers? I cannot tell you. We'll see where, where we get. So hopefully that answers the question. So now I will ask um, Dave too a question that is very technical. <laughs> so, uh, encoder and decoder seem to assume sort of consistency in the overarching design across iterations. And how can these consistent assumptions be made? It seems to assume, I'm sorry, I missed that word. Uh, assume some sort of consistency in overarching design across iterations. Yeah, certainly, I, I think the answer to the question is why are these networks structured the way they are? And I think that is actually a very good question, and it's certainly, I think, a topic of research in terms of people have certainly developed these networks to do image processing, um, and kind of the overall structure they've developed works very well. When you have very complicated systems like we do, where some may be image quant type quantities and others may be kind of performance metrics, the networks will look very, very different. And the question would be, what does that network, network structure look, look like? And I don't know. I think that's a very, actually a potential, potential research topic. Thank you. Next question is for Michael Hadi. So what sort of power electronics do envision next generation motors to use? Good question. Power electronics, um, aside from thermal management, is not my field. Um, but I listed a couple of um, areas that are possible as I was reading. Embedded capacitors, much smaller circuits, much more energy efficient circuits could be the sort of power electronics that go in incredibly more efficient motors next generation. Uh, then this is a question for Chris. Will level five vehicles be BVs? Uh, computation requirements suggest range would be restricted. Hybrids likelier? A very good question and a very good observation. Uh, fully automated vehicles or highly automated vehicles today in the prototype stage or testing stage have very large and significant electrical energy requirements. For example, the spinning top LiDAR that you see on top of most vehicles today is a 1.2 kilowatt electric device. So if you have three per vehicle, that's 3.6 currently. Now, the idea is to take those to solid state devices, which would be of the order of six or 700 watts of electrical power. But just taking the prototype vehicles today with full rack mounted computers that fill up the trunk or the back of the vehicle, it's not un unusual for a vehicle to have five or 10 or 12 kilowatts of electrical requirement today. Again, these are test vehicles, prototype vehicles. It's not anticipated that in the future production vehicles would have the same requirements. But as you well know, a Nissan LEAF, for example, uses about an average five kilowatt electrical power while traveling on a typical city type cycle, city driving cycle. So you could quite easily double the electric requirement on a vehicle, or in other words, halve its electric range if it was a fully electric battery electric vehicle. So the short answer is today, L5, test and prototype vehicles, as you can probably tell from the pictures, are almost exclusively hybrids or plug-in hybrids. And at some point in the future, when the power requirements 
for the sensing and the computation on board comes down dramatically, then we could probably foresee these vehicles as being full BEVs. But in this inefficient interim period of which we speak, it's likely that they will continue to be hybrids. So yes, powertrain efficiency and powertrain optimization for hybrids and plug-in hybrids is obviously a key area of research and development for the development of L3, L4, L5 vehicles. Thank you. Grigori, question for you. Did you consider internal combustion engine as a range extender instead of a fuel cell for the electric aircraft? I think that uh, internal combustion engine may be a good interim solution, especially if uh, it can be powered with sustainable fuel, like biodiesel, for example. Or, and if you have a range extender, you can run internal combustion engine at the peak efficiency, and we know that peak efficiency may be pretty high. So, of course, uh, it doesn't, uh, if it's fossil fuel, we'll still have CO2 emissions, uh, and eventually we will probably transfer to sustainable fuels. Back to Chris. Mm. What specific technology does RPA think is needed to avoid a dystopian future? <laughs> that, that's a really good question. You mean generically or for the purpose of vehicles? Because they're I did not ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been asking David that machine learning, how do we avoid our robot overlords of the future? No, uh, as far as vehicles are concerned, it's a wide range. So again, we're very interested in more efficient propulsion systems and powertrains. We're very interested in vehicle light weighting. Of course, this is a, a highly, you know, it's a well-established and well-trodden pathway. But we're looking for more interesting uh, methods and techniques of vehicle light weighting. And then the third area is the area of either pass improved passive or active safety. So are there active safety things we can do perhaps with uh, more automated vehicles that can make them intrinsically safer? I'm being deliberately vague because we don't really have a distinct area of focus. The idea is to cast a broad net across the powertrain, the energy storage, the energy conversion, the vehicle design, uh, the light weighting, the material substitution, the, the materials discovery, if you like, and then extending into both active and passive safety techniques for vehicles. A broad net. Thank you. Mike O'Hardy, question for you. Between thermal management of the electric motors and integration of motor and the drive, which one do you think plays a bigger role? I think as I mentioned, this is, would not be successful unless if it's a core design problem. Um, it really depends on the type of motor, uh, the type of electronics you ride, the power electronics, if the motor is for oil drilling and uh, under surface exploration, very high temperatures and high pressures. Naturally, the type of electronics you use there might be gallium nitride or silicon carbide versus your silicons. The type of thermal management solution that you use there would also depend on the type of motor. So I would uh, not be able to say which one is more important, but what I focused was without thermal management, you basically would be reducing the life of your motor. Uh, as such, but today's techniques are bulky and including oil and gas uh, drilling operations, pretty bulky and expensive solutions. I think this question is for me. Uh, it's asking you, actually stating that heavier airframes that store batteries increase the cost of the buying of the aircraft and offset cost savings from using electric. What can do be done about this? I was hoping I was addressing that with my pitch today, that that's the whole trade-off between you know, how much batteries you need, how much weight you actually have to carry, and how do you design the aircraft with cost, cost in mind. And also to make it clear, we are not proposing by any means that batteries are the solution, and that's why we are in similarly, the, how Chris is talking about ground vehicles, for aircraft we are also open to listen to what are the possible solutions that can get us up there. Is it fuel, sir? Is it hybrid? We'll, we'll see. Uh, Dave, you seem to get very specific technical <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so let me see, it was here. Um, I'll, they were asking basically, for, for some reason the question has disappeared, but uh, the question is, how can you ensure for machine learning that convolutions are correct? Um, well, that's a very good question. That's certainly a risk element in terms of you may just want to use machine learning for kind of interim stages of your optimization and do your final stage with real models that don't have the machine learning elements of them. So certainly accuracy of the encoder and decoder are very critical. And that's the whole purpose of kind of the autoencoder, to encode those, those two networks in such a way that they provide you an your uh, predictions of adequ with adequate fidelity, but certainly the, 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 there is risk there to be addressed. Thank you. And Grigori, uh, what is the stability of fuel cell use at the attitude, at a certain attitude? Do chemicals remain stable and at the proper phase? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, you know, we can uh, get uh, fuels or which can be liquid at very high altitude. It's not a problem. Or, for example, many alcohols would be liquid, ammonia would be liquid or at these temperatures. Or I, I think that our fuel cell actually give much more flexibility than any other option uh, in using different fuels. And we are getting close to the end of the session 3.15, so I will take one question and any of my colleagues that want to pitch in, they're welcome to do so. Uh, the question is that aircraft use only 10% of transportation energy. Why focus on this area when the impact is relatively low? And my answer would be that this is the current state of the art, but with all the drivers that we see in the market, it's very hard to predict how much of transportation will actually go towards aviation with all the on-demand travel. And I myself has mentioned that we actually looked into relieving some of the congestion on the ground by getting more into an air, providing more economic options. Uh, so that will be the impact, impact if, you, if you wished. And it's up for a debate if, if that is significant or not. And uh, so I may add to that that actually pollution per passenger mile is much higher for avia travel, aviation travel than any other type of travel. I'd like to add the uh, space commercialization, more and more, more uh, aerospace applications, air taxis, two passengers, four passengers, six passengers, air cargo. So I think uh, the three percent may not be the status of the future. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question for Mike. By product of gas engine in airplane was heat that could be used for cabin heating. Did it pres was it presented in analysis that it was taken into account? No, no, not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, being a systems person, would want to add that perhaps, you know, we can actually use that uh, heat that we will have in electric aircraft for the same purposes. You know, it will, it will, yeah, it, it will have to be you know heat waste use. It will be a different system, but it, it can be used. I would like to say that today no single aircraft has a recuperator in it, meaning all the energy that you burn you dump out. So there's tremendous opportunity there to recover waste heat, but there is problems for weight and efficiency there. Uh, a question for Mike. Do you suggest single phase or two phase cooling for next gen motors? I'm not biased either one. I think it's a core design problem. It's, uh, again, as I said, it depends on the temperature, it depends on the motor, the function, when possible. Learn from um, biological systems and human body. You don't sweat if you don't need to. Um, basically, single phase cooling, but you do need rapid cooling, then you sweat, you use the sweat in your body. Uh, to cool off, so it depends on the case. I think we are at the end of our session. Thank you for all your questions, and please feel free to approach us and also uh, for uh, some additional questions and also to attend some of the upcoming sessions where we'll have very specific technical topics like machine learning applied to energy space. Uh, again, I'm sure that you'll have lots of fun at this uh, RP Summit. There are upcoming fast pitches and lots of good ideas coming for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.